Welcome to Elite Expert Insider Podcast, where we will inspire, motivate, and educate entrepreneurs, innovators, and growth seekers. Brought to you by Elite Online Publishing, making the best and brightest in the industry number one best selling authors. 80% of people say they want to write a book. We're assuming that's the same for you. If so, contact us at www.eliteonlinepublishing.com and make your book a reality. Hi, Melanie Johnson, along with Jen Foster. How are you doing, Jen? Doing great. It's another great day. Welcome to another fantastic episode. Um, so listen, make sure you subscribe to our podcast, Elite Expert Insider. You're always going to learn something. You're going to get motivated. You're going to get educated. Um, today, we're going to learn about how Amazon can totally mess with what you're selling. So if you are selling anything on Amazon, or even if you're a customer of Amazon and you're wondering about why this product's on sale. But you know, if you're selling something on Amazon, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Let's put it that way. They can totally pull the rug out from under you. And also, I'm a Texan. Jen is from Utah. But you know, my kids always talk about Texas history about, you know, mom, Texas can be its own country. So Daniel Miller here today. And uh, sorry about that, Daniel. Um, and we're going to talk about how uh, the independence of Texas. He's written a book about it. Um, so let's get started. Welcome. Thanks, Daniel. Hi. <laughs> well, Daniel, tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, your practice and all the different things that you do there in Texas. Sure. Um, you know, I, I am a sixth generation Texan. Uh, my ancestors here in Texas go all the way back to uh, the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, the, the final battle for Texas independence, where we won our, our independence back in 1836. Uh, I'm, I'm currently president of the Texas Nationalist Movement, which is an organization that was founded in, in 2005 uh, to pursue the political, cultural, and economic independence of Texas. And, uh, you know, when we started, support for independence was in single digits, although I always like to say uh, that we've always been uh, ha had a higher approval rating in Texas than the U.S. Congress has. Uh, but, uh, you know, honestly, that's not that hard, Right. Um, but since then, we, we've grown uh, the organization to one of the largest political organizations in Texas. Uh, one of the latest polls showed that over half of Texas Republicans, half of uh, independent voters, and uh, even over a third of Democrats support our, or at least having a vote on this. So, uh, you know, we, we've done a, a great job um, I, I just out there with a, a total grassroots movement, volunteer supported. Uh, and it's, uh, it's always been a great ride. <laughs> well, you know, let's jump, since we're kind of starting with your background a little bit, let's sure. jump into your book. Tell us a little bit about your book and your motivation for the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, this is my second book. Uh, back in, in 2011, I wrote a book called Line in the Sand, and it dealt primarily with sort of the philosophical underpinnings of what, what has been referred to as Texas nationalism. Uh, you know, this idea that Texas should become an independent nation. And uh, when it, when it, uh, as we progressed, you know, as the movement has grown and support has grown, you know, we, we've shifted along from the, the philosophical aspects of it, you know, from the why aspect of it to uh, how this could happen. So, uh, you know, when, when we got down to uh, the, the tail end of last year, Line in the Sand had been out of print for probably about a year. And uh, we approached uh, Defiance Press, who is the publisher of the new book, Texas, uh, visited with them about getting line in the sand back in print. And that's when the, the spark came that, hey, we need a, we need a book that deals with the, the practical aspects of Texas becoming an independent nation. So that's, uh, that was really where it came from. Uh, it's, it's about 20 years worth of research. I've been involved in this fight since 1996. Uh, and it's about 20 years worth of, of research and history, but all placed right here in, in our current political uh, landscape. So, uh, you know, and, and it deals, if, if I were to compare the two, I would say one is practical and one is definitely philosophical. I mean, do you think it's like really a possibility? I mean, what's the reality of that happening? Yeah, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that it's a, a a hope, wish, or a dream. I think it's an inevitability. Um, really? You know, that's that's where this is at. And, and I look at it from the standpoint of um, 
I look at it from the standpoint of a really kind of a global perspective. One of the books that really kind of set me on this path or that at least reinforced when it was introduced to me was uh, oddly enough, the book global paradox by John Nesbitt, you know, Nesbitt was mega trends, mega trends, 2000. I mean, you know, the guy has got credibility out the wazoo uh, and, and global paradox affected me greatly because although the book was primarily about the telecommunications revolution, uh, the, the thesis of the book was that the world's trends point overwhelmingly toward uh, economic interdependence and political independence. And, and I think that even though he started off the book talking about political independence, I, I think it was kind of a, a missed opportunity, but it, but it never escaped me that he, he kind of laid that out there. And he said, look, this is the roadmap for the future. But when you look at it, it's not that hard to understand. You know, at the end of World War II, there were 54 recognized countries around the world. And at the end of the 20th century, there were 192. So, you know, when I look at Texas becoming an independent nation, we look at current political trends, we look at global geopolitical trends, and, and we understand that it's, going, it's an inevitability. It's going to happen at some point in the very near future. Wow. Yeah, and, and so some people like, here up in, in Utah, like, I don't think we've ever even thought about that unless it's people who are more, you know, thinking more about that or following kind of your, the path from Texas. So explain exactly what does your title mean? Texit? Does that <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it, it really, it really comes as a mashup, obviously of Texas and exit, but, uh, the origin really kind of of the, the, the mashup term goes back to the Greek Eurozone crisis, you know, back, Pre-Brexit, uh, people were talking about this crisis, this debt crisis in Greece, and, and especially how there was a possibility that uh, Greece could effectively re either remove itself from the Eurozone, aka not use the Euro as currency, go back to the drachma, or the EU to try to contain this economic contagion could basically kick Greece out of uh, using the Euro. And, and so you, you had in this article, uh, you had these two economists coin the term Grexit. Well, we saw Grexit and we're like, wait a minute, this, we have an X in our name. So it works, a, it works a whole lot better. So, you know, we began to sporadically use it, but it, it didn't come into really the popular consciousness until, uh, you know, the, this issue of, of the UK voting to leave the European Union and, you know, obviously Brexit was a playoff of Grexit. Mm -hmm. And, and once Brexit kind of entered into the public consciousness, then obviously, you know, Texit became just kind of a, a natural thing for supporters of Texas independence to, to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what message would you say should other states get from reading your book? Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. I mean, the people in other states may look at this and go, well, that's just about Texas, but really and truly uh, it's written about a, a much larger issue related to uh, much larger issues, plural related to the federal union through a Texas perspective. So while there are some things that are decidedly Texas centric in the book, you know, for example, you know, why is it that Texans culturally are so fiercely independent uh, or, you know, some of the, some of the economic issues like, you know, Texas overpaying, anywhere from 103 to $160 billion a year into the union. That's more we pay in than we get out. Uh, there are some, some aspects in there where I'm essentially encouraging people in every state to go in and fundamentally re-examine their relationship within the federal union, to, to look at our relationship, not just with the federal government, but with one another as states and say, does it really serve our people? Um, I'll give you one, one short example uh, of something that applies across the board. Uh, there was a, a study that I cite in the book from George Mason University uh, where they wanted to study the effect of what's called federal regulatory accumulation. Basically, the federal government passes this regulation, and then rather than repealing it or adjusting it, they just pass another on top of it. So George Mason University goes back to 1949, looking at federal regulatory accumulation. And they say, we want to understand what the impact is on the household income. 
So they look at it and they say, okay, at the time the study was published, the median household income was about $54,000 a year. The study concluded that in the absence of that federal regulatory accumulation since 1949, the average median household income would have been $330,000 a year. So, you know, we, we begin to look at it and we realize that if, if we were operating, whether it's Texas or any of these other states, if we were operating as self-governing independent nation states, one of the things it's going to immediately mean for me and you and everyone out there is about a 600% pay increase, <laughs> you know, how, how much we get to take home. And, and, you know, it's studies like that, that, that are done that get buried that people don't understand because uh, again, it's sort of taboo to, to question the, the fundamental gut structure of governance that we have. Then I got to, you know, the question I have is about defense. How do you defend yourself as a small independent country? I mean, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent, but um, yeah, that would be my question. Well, you know, you look at it and you, and, and I know it's going to sound facetious, so please don't take this wrong, but pull out a globe, spin it, put your finger down someplace and go, how do those people defend themselves? How is it they protect themselves? Uh, because, you know, every, every country around the world has some method of, of protection, whether it be they have their own army or they engage in mutual defense pacts with other countries. You know, that's, that's the way that it's done. So, you know, specifically here in Texas, um, you know, if we were to use what is kind of a global average, just say like the, the, let, let's take the NATO benchmark. Okay. There was a, a, a rule passed for NATO, the North Atlantic treaty organization, uh, which is a military defense pact, a mutual defense pact. And, and basically what they did was they set a 2% of GDP target for national defense. And they said, okay, if you're part of NATO, your country needs to be spending a minimum of 2% of GDP uh, for national defense. And, and what we find here in Texas is, you know, you apply that 2% to a GDP that makes us the ninth or 10th largest economy in the world. And what that means is that, is that we have one of the most well-funded militaries in the world just by applying the NATO minimum standards. So, you know, it, it's not this idea where suddenly a state leaves the union and it's an island unto itself. Uh, mutual defense pacts exist around the world. Uh, countries are part of them, but that doesn't mean that they give up their individual uh, political, economic, and cultural identity. Well, we better, before our show gets over, we better transition to the, what happened to your book when it was on Amazon? Yeah. Uh, when you first launched it to what happened, walk us through that. Yeah, apparently uh, I covered some things that uh, I wasn't supposed to cover. I must have said some things that they got some people upset, but but here's, here's it in a nutshell. Um, after the book had been out for a while, I mean, the sales were great. Uh, you know, we, we were doing book tours and, and doing things of that nature. Uh, we wake up one day and what we find is that Amazon has put what, what eventually became known internally as the trifecta of doom. Uh, they restricted book sales to prime members only. Uh, they limited, they limited book sales to four copies per customer, uh, which was kind of a problem for us because people are buying multiple copies of this thing and, and handing it out like they're pamphlets. Uh, and then what they did was they dropped the price below wholesale. And, uh, you know, while I, I'm not primarily an author, I don't understand what the implications of those things are. Uh, you know, what, what became of that investigation over the intervening six weeks is, uh, they, the distributor came back and essentially said they believe that all of this was being done specifically, uh, because of the content of the book. And, and they said that with a, a large degree of experience, the, the, Distributor has a 40-year history in the book business. Uh, you know, they've got over a 1,000 titles placed with Amazon. Uh, not only had they never seen this with any of their titles, they haven't seen this happen with any other titles, and they could not get any kind of direct or straight answers out of Amazon. And, and I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll break it here to you guys because we haven't said anything about this publicly. Uh, but the, the publisher, uh, the, the distributor has since been bought out by one of the larger distributors. Uh, they've got over a million items in Amazon inventory. This distributor is a top 20. 
uh, within Amazon vendors. So, Can I you know, who that is just so we know it's IPG. Uh, and so I, IPG began to investigate this. And, and again, they said not only could they not get a straight answer, but as far as they understand through all the investigation that they've done, this is the only book that this has been done to. So, uh, you know, it, it's been, it's been a roller coaster, uh, oddly enough on the beginning, you know, it's been a, almost a constant fight with Amazon on the first day of banned books week. Uh, they removed, they removed text it from stock and w refuse to sell anymore. You know, so you talk about irony of ironies, right? So at each stage of the game, when things like this have happened, what our recourse has only been to um, communicate with our supporters, let our supporters, let our members know what's going on. Uh, and then they ramp the pressure up on Amazon. And typically they relent, like when they pulled us down on, you know, on banned books week, we were back up within 48 hours. So, you know, I, I don't know what the solution to this is. I, I'm, I'm apt to believe in a, a free market solution to this, but uh, you know, with Amazon doing what they're doing and, and some of the things that we're seeing out of Facebook and, and Twitter and, and some of these other, um, you know, some of these other tech giants, uh, I think it's all time. We take a very serious look at, at how we're going to address this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that you're being persistent in going down the path of what finding out what really is happening and making sure you take a stand and, and getting your book out there, whether, um, you know, it's just in independent bookstores or, or other, you know, Costco's or wherever you can get the book out. So, right. Well, and look, that's what we've been telling people, uh, you know, look, Amazon, they may be the 800 pound gorilla in the room. You know, they may be the behemoth, but they're not the only ones. You know, Barnes and Noble's out there. Independent booksellers are out there. We sell it direct on our website. You can buy it from the publisher. So, uh, you know, it, it, we're just encouraging people to explore their alternatives. If, if they're disgusted and upset by what Amazon has done and, and their lack of accountability, then, you know, thankfully, there are options. And, and so that's what we're encouraging people to do is explore those options. So we've seen as publishers sometimes where they limit like our authors are like, oh my gosh, I need a bunch of books and I need them like in the next day or two days. And when they go to order them wholesale through their distributor or Amazon, it's two weeks to get them there. So um, they try and buy them, but they can only buy four. So we just tell them go back and buy four, then buy four more, then buy four more. Right. And what you're saying, it's like once they buy four, they cut them off. No, you can't buy any more. Yeah, that was the thing that kind of stunned us is that it was not four per order. It was four per customer. And yeah. so, you know, you had, you had people that had, they went and they bought four copies. And then they, you know, they obviously they keep a copy for themselves. They hand them out to family and friends. They went to go buy additional copies and couldn't buy any more copies. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, you know, it was a sort of a six week ordeal that once they began to relent on those issues, I mean, that, that was great, but now you've got six weeks where this has happened and then they, they ramped up. I mean, it, it was, it was the oddest thing. I mean, we, we ran into issues where they said they didn't have stock, but the publisher knew that they had stock in all their warehouses. Um, they, they were telling, you know, that you would go to order the book and it would be, Hey, this is great. If you choose two day shipping, you, you too can have this book in two to four weeks, even yeah. though we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, they had them uh, available in all warehouses. So, uh, you know, look, it's just, it's the fight we fight. It, it, this was fighting for this to become to, for this conversation to enter into the political mainstream, which it has. I mean, I talk about that in the book. Uh, it was an uphill climb. It was a fight every step of the way. So, you know, this sort of, I would say it rolls off our back like water off a duck's back, uh, but we've had to fight every step of the way just to be heard. So this is nothing new for us. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Amazon and, and Facebook and Twitter and those guys think that we're going to fold like Superman on laundry day, but they are so mistaken. <laughs> Well, you know, I think the other bigger lesson to learn for, for everybody, whether you're, whether you're selling a, 
a product or a service and you have a platform that you're doing it on to like uh, for us, even as a publisher hearing this. So Amazon is the main place that you want to sell your book. But um, in your instance, you said, all right, well now we've got to ramp up all these other places where maybe you weren't doing that before. So um, I think Jen and I are going to learn, let's make sure we have all the other platforms totally ramped up. Everything else is to go. So those are just as strong as your platform on Amazon. So whether you have another outlet where you're selling a service, um, you know, or have one big customer, make sure your other things, other outlets are just as strong. Don't count on that one uh, distributor or that one place to sell your products and services. Make sure you have other places that can be just as strong because otherwise, you know, they pull the plug, then where are you? Yeah. And you know, that's, that's the big fear that we have. Um, you know, we, uh, over the years we've spent, you know, and, and this is beyond the Amazon aspect. I mean, now we're talking about Facebook and, and Twitter, uh, but we, we spent a, a long time uh, connecting with our folks on these platforms. Uh, at, at one time, not too long ago, uh, we had more Facebook fans on our Facebook page than the Republican Party of Texas and the Democratic Party of Texas combined. <clears throat> and, you know, these were all active supporters. These were not passive likes. I mean, they were active folks. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we have seen over time is that with the algorithm changes, how they are no longer favoring pages, uh, how we're seeing, you know, some of the other aspects. I mean, I, uh, you know, I told you about the Amazon thing, but our, our Facebook saga goes back two years. Uh, they actually suspended our ad account, uh, at the beginning of the year when we were getting ready to, prom as we started promoting the book, upcoming book tour and purchasing ads. Uh, they actually suspended our ad account because they went back to November, October, well, actually the last week of October, 2016, found two ads that dealt with illegal immigration. Uh, and and they, they were asking nothing more of, you know, do you, are you concerned about the border and illegal immigration, which we know people are because it's the number one concern for uh, registered voters here in Texas. Yep. and a link to our page. And so, you know, they went back to 2016, found two ads and used those as the, as the pretext to cancel our ad account when we went to go promote the book tour. So, you know, we're, we're learning. Uh, I mean, I, I say we're learning, it's just been, it's been a never ending fight with these guys and the, the challenge that we run into, maybe not so much with Amazon and, and book sales because we've got all these other outlets, but when it comes to these communications platforms, uh, as we begin to see the very odd reasons that people are being deplatformed or shadow banned. I mean, I know some people say that's fake, but I, I'm here to attest that it is definitely not fake because it happens to us on the regular basis. Uh, but you know, what, what do people like us, whether, you know, it's us with a, a political viewpoint or even even entrepreneurs that may be that may be pursuing brand new paradigms in marketing. I mean, wh whatever that is, you know, what do we do when they begin to close us off on these platforms from the people that we've connected with? And it's a concern for everyone, and it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Make sure you have different ways to capture and to collect those groups and keep those groups active somewhere else or maybe on your own platform or your own blog or your own website or something like that. But what's yeah. uh, what's really saved us has, and I'll tell you with all the social media shenanigans, what's really saved us has been the email list. I mean, after all that time building an email list and then going and building social media because everyone said email is dead. Now all of a sudden email is the, about the most surefire way that we can communicate with people. Uh, so it's uh, you know, Another thing we've noticed is, is kind of like, you know, if you zig when everyone else is zagging, right? right. So everyone's electronic, electronic. It's like uh, send something really personal through the regular mail, through snail mail. Right. And uh, we just had a, a marketer that sent these big packages out to all of his fan base. And you're like, wow, you know, it stands out in the mail. It's something different because you're not getting that anymore. Because my mail, I mean, I get maybe two or three letters every day, if that. And it's usually just bills and stuff I haven't opted out of the electronic stuff for. Well, so. fine. I'll go dust off my MySpace. Thanks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. Well, tell us where we can reach you, Daniel. Sure. Uh, you can find out more about the organization, more about the book at, at our website. It's tnm.me. TNM, like Texas Nationalist Movement, TNM.me. Great. We'll put that link up at the bottom. Thanks so much for, for being here on our interview today. 
Hey, this is great, guys. Thank you all so much for having me on. Okay, now remember everybody, subscribe to our podcast and make sure you share it with other people because we always have great guests like Daniel. So you always learn something, get motivated, get inspired and make your life better. And if you're thinking about writing a book and becoming a best-selling author, we would love to help you here at Elite Online Publishing. We have made over almost 60 authors, number one bestsellers on Amazon and we'd like to do the same for you. So we'll see you next time. Bye. If you'd like to create the most powerful advertising tool for your business, contact us at EliteOnlinePublishing.com, where we will help you create, publish, and make your book a number one bestseller, and show you how to get new leads and more revenue for your business. If you'd like to check us out on our Facebook page, we have a free book for you as our gift. Just go and click Free Book. Remember to subscribe and leave a comment for our podcast. We would love to hear from you.